Hey everyone, Pastor Brady here. So glad that you are tuning in and checking out Christ Church. We pray that you are convicted and encouraged by the sermon that you are about to listen to. However, we do want to say that this should not replace your belonging to a local body of Christ. If you are in the Sterling or Rock Falls or a surrounding community, we look forward to seeing you on a Sunday morning. And if you're not in one of those communities, Again, really grateful. We pray that this sermon blesses you, but I want to encourage you to be plugged in and belong to a local body of church. This is not a replacement for that. With that being said, I hope that this sermon blesses you, and we pray that you are plugged into a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church. Good morning, everyone. I was going to say, that's a nice Bible. Uh, my name is Paul Benkowski. Uh, I've been attending here with my three children, Eve, Dylan, and Noel, for the past about five years. And this morning, our passage is going to be in Genesis 23, 1 through 20. And if you want to follow along with the church Bible, you'll find it underneath the chair in front of you, and it's going to be on page 16. Now let's hear the word of the Lord. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from the, before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, in which he owns, it is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham, in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron, in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My lord, listen to me. What a piece of land worth four hundred shekels of silver, what is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham answered, listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. Four hundred shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, before all who went in at the gate of his, his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, which is, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan, the field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Morning, everyone. Morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Uh, before we get started in Genesis, I want to talk briefly about Easter because it's next month. I know that. Not to shock anybody, but we're almost at Easter. And as you know, we are, we're doing those 40-day devotionals, and we'll have two small groups. So if you and your family are reading the 
the illustrated book, you have younger children, we invite your whole family to come to that small group, which will be downstairs. If you don't have younger children, you have older children or no children in the house, and you're reading the other devotional, we'll meet upstairs. And I don't know why I'm saying will, I'll be with the younger children downstairs with my two young boys. But if you are uh, able to join, we really want you to. But we're also doing something else beside that. We're also going to preach through the final week leading up to the resurrection in a series called The Eight Days That Changed Eternity. And so for the month of March, we are going to look at every Sunday, we're going to look at a different day of that week and a significant thing that happened that day and then on Good Friday as well. To help us out with this, we have these little invite cards that Andrea made that look awesome. And so we ask that you take them there over on the, uh, the table over there. Take as many as you will give out. If we run out and you go over there and you're like, they're all gone, come find me or Ella and say, hey, there's no more. We'll get more printed. We're, we're telling you actually a little earlier than we've mentioned these kinds of series in the past because we're hoping we run out. Like we want to be out of these very, very soon so we can print more. That would be a great, great thing. So please hand these out. If you're wondering, well, how will people know anything about where to go and what time to go? The back of the card has all that information. I am not showing you the back of the card up here, but the back of the card has all of those specific details. So to Genesis, we are looking at a pretty somber passage, but, a, but an interesting passage. And we live in a broken world, right? That's not news to anybody in here. And last week, if you weren't here with us, we talked about God testing. And what does it mean that God tests us? And, and we talked about how tests at their best accomplish two things. It causes us to prepare and then it launches us forward. And we use the illustration of a driving test. When you are 16 and you can get your driver's license, before you do that, you, you practice. You practice with your parents and you, you read the rules of the road and you do all these things and then you take the test and that launches you to be able to drive and opens up the world in different ways. Well, the tests from God, they, remember, they boil down to one question. Will you trust the Lord or will you trust something or someone else? Part of what tests prepare us for is suffering, for loss, and for grief. Abraham has been tested. And this morning, we're going to see what one of the things he's prepared for. He's going to say goodbye to his wife. Sarah is going to die in our passage. Throughout human history, the idea of suffering, the idea of sorrow and grief, People saw that as kind of a feature of the broken world we live in. We live in a world that's marred by sin. Of course, there'll be suffering. Of course, there'll be grief and hardship. Our current culture kind of flips that on its head. And our current culture in America tends to view suffering as this bug in the system. And you actually should live, life should be full of happy moments and it just should be the best thing ever. And if life is not catered to you, then something's wrong. That has never been how people have seen life in the world. And we're going to talk about how, how life has suffering, that grief is a part of this world. And the idea of the testing of God is that when those moments come, we'll be ready to be faithful and obedient. We're currently in a series right now called The Beginning, where we're going in, on a journey through the entire book of Genesis and today, Abraham suffers a great loss. And what we're going to see is the way that he handles it, the way that he grieves, is the way that we as the people of God should, should grieve. We should grieve in a way that says, I believe the promises of God. And we can grieve in that way. And so we're going to talk about that and dive in. So let's pray and we will look at Genesis. Lord, we thank you for your word. And even in a passage where we may be confused because why, what do we need to know about a negotiation over land with the Hittites? Lord, you are speaking to us. So Lord, help us to hear from your word today. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word and talk about it. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the word made flesh. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 
So a note about our sermon today. Have you ever heard the sentence, uh, don't miss the forest for the trees or uh, back uh, in either direction? Today's gonna be a little bit more of a forest sermon, right? There, there's some individual trees that might be interesting to really chase down in this passage, but I wanna look at some of the big themes that are talked about this. So we're not gonna dive in and weave through the entire negotiation process, but we are gonna look at the big themes that are talked about here. And the first thing we're gonna talk about in our passage this morning is a reminder of mortality. Verses one and two, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Our passage begins on a somber note. Sarah dies. This is a woman that we've gotten to know. We've seen her grieve that she's old and hasn't been able to have a child. We've seen her be promised that God was going to give her a child. We've seen her really sin, mess up in a big, big way. We've seen her get roped into sin by her husband. We've spent time with this woman. This woman, her name is Princess. This is the, the matriarch of the faith, the person who God's getting everything started with, who, who knows these promises that she's going to be the mother of everybody, that, that they, of God's people, that God is going to bless the whole world through her offspring. And she dies. And we see that Abraham grieves. And I want to take a moment to talk about death. Like stare at it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says this about what we're about to do. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. You heard Mike mention this during the call to worship this Wednesday. Yes, it's Valentine's Day, but it's also what many church traditions celebrate Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is a time when traditions have come together and remind themselves of their mortality. And maybe you've heard the famous line they say during those services, you are dust. Anybody finish it? And to dust you shall return. Maybe don't say that when you're out on your Valentine's Day date. But <laughs> it, is, it is a helpful reminder that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Sarah, she had lived a life of faith. And in a famous chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, it's, it's called the Hall of Faith. And we are told person after person who lived a faithful life, who lived an obedient life. And Sarah's mentioned She's told that she, she, we are told that she is an example of how to live a faithful life. She is named specifically for her faith. She trusted in the Lord, yet she still died. Her time still ended. Specifically, they, it ended before the promises that she hung her hope on came fully true. They're, they don't own the promised land. There's not a great nation. She has one son. They haven't blessed the entire world through Abraham and Sarah yet. There's one son. She's seen none of it come true. She's had a glimpse, that's it. And yet she still dies before it comes true. A theologian, Alan Ross, he says this, a life of patient waiting for the promises now faded. She waited patiently, and she didn't fully see him. Death isn't fun to think about. I'm not looking out a bunch of smiling faces right now after this conversation. And I think we can respond to death in one of two ways, typically. The first is there are people who are just paralyzed by it. The idea that death is coming means I'm just gonna sit in my house and not do anything that might take a risk. And that overflows into other areas of life where they they don't take any sorts of risks because they don't want to risk anything, especially their life. But then I think the other extreme, the other way we could respond to the fact that we're going to die someday uh, is summed up in a couple phrases that are famous in our society or have been famous throughout history. Carpe diem, right? Seize the day. YOLO, if you're younger than carpe diem, you only live once. It's the idea that, hey, you... Death is coming. Might as well do whatever you want. And you can use that phrase in a positive way. Be like, so 
take the risk and go for the promotion, own the company, start the business, whatever. It can also be used in a very negative way. Hey, you only live once, so do whatever you want to do for this weekend, however you may hear it. But death, it actually serves as a sombering reminder of the gift of life. If we allow it to, it serves as a reminder of the gift we have been given. How many in here chose to be born? None, none of us. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose our city or country of origin. We don't choose various components of ourselves. We just are given gifts. Here's your family. Here's where you live. Here's this. And, and if we think of them as gifts, when someone gives you a good gift, the way to honor the gift giver is to honor the gift. And so let's remind ourselves that we have a great gift. We've been given life. Look around. Many of you are sitting with your family. Some of you are sitting with friends that are as close as family. Look at them and be like, I have a gift right here. This is a gift that I have. And while, while Sarah had moments where her faith took a dip, there were times where she didn't trust like she should. She honored the gift by having a life that was marked by obedience and faith. That's what scripture tells us. And death can remind us, and this is a very important lesson, that we're not ultimately in control. We're not ultimately in charge, right? Death's gonna come for everybody. We're not the ones in charge. There's someone else who is in charge. Think about the moment at a funeral. We read Ecclesiastes, the house of mourning. When you're at a funeral, there's this weird tension of emotions you may feel. There's a very real sense of grief, even if it's a person who lived a uh, well-lived life, advanced in years, and you're like, yeah, no regrets. They've lived an awesome life. There's still some grief there, or it's a young person who maybe left behind a family, a, a young child. Maybe it was a, a child themselves, and we use the phrase in our society, they've, they're gone too soon. But not only are you primarily grieving, maybe you also have that moment of, but that could be me. There's no reason that that's not me. I remember that moment when my wife and I found out a, a good friend of ours, same age as us with a young child, a little older than our oldest, found out she had stage four cancer, obviously grieving. And we prayed for her healing for years before she ultimately passed. But we also had that moment, we looked at each other and it's like, why isn't this one of us? There's no reason it shouldn't have been one of us. There was a, a several years ago, and I, I share this as a, as, a, as an example of how looking at death can, and thinking about this can cause us to appreciate that gift. Several years ago, this is probably the moment where I would say is the closest I've looked death in the face. Uh, my wife and I were driving to a basketball game for a student that was in my youth group. It was raining, it was rush hour. So I was driving at least 50, 55 on the highway. And there was, you know, those cars that just, you're like, slow down, like, just calm down. The cars that are weaving in and out of traffic, well, there was a car that was weaving in and out of traffic. And if I would have stayed put, the back of his car would have hit the front of mine. And so I tried to pretend to be James Bond for a minute and I swerved to not get in a car accident. The problem was that it was raining and our back tires totally lost control. And on the freeway with everyone during rush hour, our car spins out. It's actually kind of freaky. You can drive past where we spun out on the freeway back in Columbus and still see tire skids. Like I can point to it and be like, that's where I thought I was going to die. So we're, we're spinning. I hear Jessica screaming next to me, which makes sense. And I remember vividly thinking, this is it. Someone any second now, T-bone. I was just waiting for it. Next thing I know, the car stops. We're facing the wrong way on the freeway. Jessica could have rolled down the window and touched the concrete divider. We weren't touched. That, that night we went to the basketball game. We were a little bit happier to see our friends. That night when Jessica and I went to bed, we hugged each other a little tighter. We were a little bit more grateful for the gift of life that we had. But when that gift ends, it is right to grieve. Abraham lost his wife. 
And so he's grieving. But we shouldn't simply grieve. We should grieve in a way that shows that we believe even God's unfulfilled promises. As I said, Abraham and Sarah have not seen the fulfillment of all of the promises. It has all not come true yet. Most of it has not. They have one son, hardly a nation of people. They have one son. But there's a way to grieve that shows that you think everything's done. And then there's a way to grieve that shows that we believe and that we have hope. There's Thessalonians chapter four says this, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do, who have no hope. There is a clear distinction between how those who grieve that do not have the hope of Jesus and how those who have that hope, how they grieve. Now, the majority of our passage this morning, and this is what I mean by we're not going to dive into every individual tree, is about a negotiation process where Abraham goes to this, this Hittite people, these people that live in the promised land, and they own the land. They are the people who live there. And if you look, Abraham, starting in verse three, he rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold you from his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. And he said to them, if you were willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me for Ephron, the, the son of Zoar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field for the full price. Let, me give it, er, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying per place. And you may be sitting here, and this is one of those passages. Maybe you read this and go, when do I ever need to know how to negotiate with the Hittite people for owning a field and a cave? As you may know, our church is currently looking for a building. This isn't helpful even for that. <laughs> Unless, I, I don't think there's any Hittites that own any buildings here in Sterling. Lee is confirming that there are not. <laughs> but what's the, what's the message here? During this process of negotiation, we read a lot of details. We, we learn that Abraham is an extremely humble man. We see him bowing to these people. We see him deferring to them, saying even, no, let me pay full price. Let me honor you as the owners of this and let me pay full price. But the overarching theme in this passage is that this land is the land that was promised to Abraham. And so that's where he wants to bury his family. We initially may want to zoom past this, but I want to pause on that note for just a second. Many people, when they die, they, they want to be buried where their family is, where they're from. That's been true throughout history. And now there's a different practice. It's still somewhere that feels like home to you, but some people want to be their ashes to be scattered on their favorite sports team's field or something like that, the, the lake they went to growing up. But it's something about returning to where you're from. That, that's kind of how throughout history people have taken the burial process. So when Sarah dies, what Abraham quote unquote should have done is said, okay, back to Ur, that's where we're from. That's where her family's buried. That's, that's where her grandparents are buried. So let's go back there and bury Sarah back at home. But instead Abraham says, this is home. Yeah, she died. And yes, we don't own the promised land yet. No, this is not our land yet but God said it's going to be. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bury my dead here. So, and not only is he gonna bury his dead there, he has to work hard for it. That is a negotiation process. That's a lot of back and forth. That's a lot of, and that's gonna cost him some money. He has a lot to do to make sure this can happen. At any point, he could have been like, eh, not worth it. It's just a dead body. No, he says, this is what was promised to us. And so I'm going to bury our dead here because this is where our family is going to be buried. This is where our family is going to live. This is where we're going to flourish and become a nation. This is where we're going to bless the entire world. And that's actually going to come back up throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. 
We'll see other, uh, other leaders in the faith who, when they die elsewhere, they're brought back to be buried here. Abraham's setting a precedent. This is what has been promised to us. And even though it doesn't look likely right now, this will be ours. And I know it will be because God has promised it to us. And look at the process. If you keep reading verses 10, 10 through 16, he, he's offering money. He's saying, here, take, take this much money and I'll offer this. And they were like, oh, that's full price. And you know how much this is going to cost and going back and forth. But the humility that, that Abraham shows is he knows that even though God has promised it to him, that the promise has not fully come true yet. And how does that work itself out? Well, it works itself out by Abraham not going up to the people of the Hittites going, hey, give me this. Come on, give it to me. You know, God has given it to me, right? So you should give it to me. Done, right? That good enough for you? Good enough for me? No, Jesus actually talks a little bit about giving to the people who oversee the world today. He, he's actually asked in, in Matthew chapter 22 about taxes, the Pharisees went and plotted him how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice said, why put me to the test? You hypocrites, show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So Jesus could have said, you're absolutely right. This whole world is God's. Those people are sinful. They're not doing things that aren't right. So no more taxes. And I'm sure many of us would be like, yeah, Jesus, like no more taxes. <laughs> we could get behind that message. Abraham could have said the same thing. God has promised me this land. I don't have to pay for this land. This is a promise from God. But Jesus says, hey, look, this, give Caesar his taxes. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Abraham, in, this, in our passage this morning, instead of saying, hey, God has made me this promise, this is mine, he says, here's full price. Here's full price for what God has promised me. <laughs> like He's paying for this. That's wild to me. He gives full price, even though he knows that the promise has not come fully true yet. He could have said, well, maybe God was wrong. Why should I buy this? Maybe God's promise isn't actually going to come true. Maybe we've, some of us have had that thought before. Maybe God's not actually going to set the whole world right. Maybe God's not going to execute justice. Maybe God's not actually going to save us. Maybe Jesus won't return. And it's, maybe we want to give up. Maybe Abraham wanted to give up. But instead he says, no, I'm, I'm going to purchase this because I believe this promise. Think about the, the promise of land. What was Abraham promised? He was promised the promised land. The only part of the land that ever was his was a grave. A grave that he paid full price for. Like, he didn't see the promised land promise come true at all. But he trusted it. He trusted that in the face of death, he knew that God's promise was going to come true. Alan Ross, the theologian, he says this, God would do far more for them than he had done in this life, which is the hope of all who die in the faith. Right? We hear the promises in, in scripture that one day we'll be saved to an eternity, we'll, we'll be given all these things, and we don't see a lot of that. Our hope is that God will do far more than maybe he even has in this life. And he goes on to say a, a couple paragraphs later in his commentary, in life, the patriarchs were sojourners. In death, they were heirs of the promise and occupied the land. In life, they were wandering around. This land wasn't their home, but in death, they came into ownership of the land. They planted their roots, so to speak. Because in death, the, that land is now 
theirs, which launches us into our final point today, how to look forward. Uh, Our passage ends, verse 19. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Again, we could talk several details here, but I want us to talk how Abraham then is setting himself to say, hey, I believe. I believe so much, I'm going to not just spend full price, I'm actually then going to bury my wife here. Like he goes through with the decision. He buries his wife in a land that they're not from. He says, this is what was promised, and I trust that God's promises will happen. There's a, there, there's a tense in the Bible that we don't often use in our day-to-day discussion. We, we talk about tenses. You've probably learned about them in school, past, present, and future. And you can split up the past tense. We don't often do this talking about grammar and English, but you could say perfect and imperfect. The imperfect past is more of an event that is still continuing in the past. So I was running. Then the perfect past is something that is contained to a moment saying the action is completely done. I ran. The Bible has this other tense. They call it the prophetic perfect. That's what theologians call it. The idea of the prophetic perfect is it's perfect. It's still past tense, but it's about something that's going to happen in the future. And God's promises are so sure that people talk about them like they already happened. That's what Abraham's trusting in. That God's promises are so sure that they might as well have already happened. We already live in the promised land. That's his hope. That's his trust. And does he? No. But he trusts that he does. And he trusts that he will because God already said that he will. And his promises are so sure that it might as well have already happened. Let's transition then to this question, how to look forward for us. Like, what do we do about this? This is Abraham. This was a long, long time ago. Christians throughout history, there are famous stories of Christians who, as they were going to their death, these Christians who hung on to the promises of God, who trusted that the Lord would forgive them, that he would save them, that he would set all things right. As they were going to their death of being burned alive, fed to lions, drowned, all these things, they were singing hymns. There are stories of people who, as they're going to their death, it looks like they're going to their wedding day. Like that's the joy that's on their face. They believed in the promises that, hey, one day God's going to set everything right. And I'm sure before the flame was lit under some of those martyrs, they weren't looking around going, oh, I bet it's going to happen the next 30 seconds. I'm probably about to get out of this. No, they, they trusted that in death, they were going to see the promises come fully true when they were with their Savior. One of the more famous stories, this man named Jan Hus. He was a Czech theologian from the 1400s. He was burned alive because of his faith. And the day he was burned alive, he sang these words out. This is how much he trusted the promises of God in his life. Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. That's how much he trusted. And he was like, oh, son of the living God, have mercy on me. I'm coming to see you. Like that's how, he's looking around. Promises don't look like they're sure. For sure they don't. But he's saying, I know they're sure. I trust my savior. Because in scripture, we're, we're promised that God will execute justice, that we will have eternal life, that we will experience all things light and life and good forever, that every tear will be wiped away but there are times when we look around our world and it just doesn't seem like that's coming. We can talk about famous Christian martyrs like Jan. We can, we can look in our world today. We can look at the underground Chinese church. We can look at the church in Iran or in India where people are truly right now being persecuted for their faith. We can look at our lives. We can look at the news. We can, we can turn things on and say, man, I know we don't have that kind of persecution in our backyard right now, but life is hard. Is God actually going to set all this right? Do you, 
Do you hear the news? Do you hear what's happening? Do you know what phone call I just got about my loved one or myself? What, what diagnosis they just received? Is God going to set this right? Is God going to heal us all? The answer is yes. It just may not be in this life. And we can hold that intention that we have a gift of this life and that God's promises will come fully true in the next life. Our hope is not simply in a piece of land. Abraham's hope, he, he hoped in a piece of land, but it was beyond that. He was hoping in his God. If you know the story of the Old Testament, you know the people end up losing the land. They end up ha- giving into idolatry. They end up following their hearts and trusting other gods and God sends them into exile. Our hope is not that we get to return to the physical piece of land. Our hope is in the new heavens and new earth that we will spend an eternal joy with our creator God forever. We are bound for that promised land, but we, we may not see that come into fruition in this life. In fact, we may, it's not just we may not see it. We will not see that come into fruition in this life. But our hope is that one day we will. Even though we're not gonna physically see it. Abraham did not physically see it, but he still trusted. So in the face of despair, in the face of suffering, in the face of bad news, in the face of a country who seems to be growing further and further and further away from the Lord, in the face of trouble, in the face of anything, we can say with absolute certainty, I'm bound for the promised land. I know what's coming. And yeah, right now this is hard, but I know it's coming. We're bound for that promised land, that promised land, the land of the new heaven and the new earth where there will be no more shame or sin or tears or cancer or hurt or abortions or pain or school shootings or whatever you may be troubled by. We know that that's the promised land we are bound for. Where all of that stuff is gone. Man, I can't wait for that day. I'm tired of turning on the news and hearing things. I'm tired of hearing friends who have gotten phone calls they never wanted to get. I'm tired of hearing phone calls about family members who are sick and who are dying. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of Christian martyrs. I'm tired of the kids getting hurt. I'm tired of all of it. I'm ready to be bound for the promised land. And that is our hope. And so our job, as we dwell on death, as we think about the gift of life that we've been given is to take God's kingdom and take it to the world. It's to take what God is doing in heaven and bring the will of God in heaven to the world. That's the great commission. And Jesus promises that he's with us as we do that, as we tell people, yes, God created you. He made you in his image. As we tell people, but you've fallen away, that you've sinned, that you've disobeyed and you've earned the wrath of God. And as we tell people, but God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we tell people, All you got to do is repent and believe. And all of that can be yours too. And you too can be bound with me to the promised land. So what we're going to do after I pray is we're going to sing a song. And if you look in your bulletin, we're singing on Jordan's Stormy Banks. This song, we are going to sing out in celebration that we are bound for the promised land. So let's, I hesitate to say this because you are a church that sings out already, but like, let's sing out that we're bound for the promised land. Would you pray with me? Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be what you created us to be. Lord, right now we know that we regularly fall short, that we sin, that we do not honor you. But Lord, we also know that we, we owe you everything. We are grateful for the gift of life. We are grateful for our families, our spouses, our friends, our children, our parents. We are grateful for the gift of life that we get to experience now. But Lord, remind us that as we go through life of grief and of suffering and of sorrow, that our hope is not in this life. 
Our hope is in the promised land that we will be with you forevermore when you set all things right. And our hope can be in that because of Jesus. Remind us of that regularly. Cause us to hope in you alone. And Lord, may we sing out in full assurance that no matter what happens, we are bound for the promised land. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.